the key verses for all our fellowship for the whole conference, all three meetings, are actually these, this first set of verses here, Ephesians 5, <clears throat> verses 25, 26, and 27. I hope that we would see these three verses, <clears throat> these three verses, actually uh, uh, cover the entire Christian life, the entire Christian life. And I also hope that you would see that these verses touch our daily life, our daily life, and make a connection between our daily life and the Lord's coming. Actually, the activity described here, especially in verse 26, that activity going on in our daily life will hasten the coming of the Lord. <laughs> and, and there's a connection. There's a connection I hope eventually we will see between these verses and these verses here in the Song of, in the Song of Songs. These verses also talk about <clears throat> the process that happens in our daily life and show how that process, that activity, which, which might even take place sitting here in this hour, it might even take place as, this, as you're sitting here. And in one way, in this first hour while I'm speaking, and then in another way, as you're sitting there, and others are speaking. There might be. And then that activity may actually continue through the afternoon. We'll see. You can tell us tonight. You can report to us if you experienced 526. That's really the, that's really the focus. What are we talking about? Well, in verse 25, and we just read that, and many of, our, of us are, are familiar. It says, of course, says something about the husbands loving the wives. That's good. Husbands love your wives. But we're going to, I'll say that once and then move it over. We're really focusing on 25B. You know, we talk this way. Christians talk this way about the Bible verses. 25A and 25B. That just means the last half of the verse. Sometimes we put 25C because the verse has three parts, but don't write that down. That's not, that's not important right now. 25B, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's in the past. And that transact, that, what, what happened there on, on the cross, Christ loving the church, the day, not the day, the moment that became real to you, your Christian life began. That transaction, that transaction. I, 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 I said this to the young people last night. Yep. I remember that night as if it was last night when the love of the Lord was presented to me and I knew Christ, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't have this view, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I had this view. Christ loved me and gave himself up for me. That, that's how. You know, there are, there are two sides, right? There are two sides. <clears throat> John 3.16 is one side. John 3.16. That is, for God so loved the world, God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, right? That uh, everyone who believes will not perish, but would have eternal life. So, so sometimes when, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if you've done this, many of us have done this, when we share the gospel with someone and we show them this verse, we say, there, there it says, for God so loved the world. And we, say, we tell them, instead of the world, say your name, put your name in there, right? And, and so they, the new one would read, for God so loved Terry. Ah, now it's personal. That he gave his only begotten son. That if, that if, Terry would believe, right? 
And that happened to me that night. That happened to me that night. And I saw he died for me. Later. Later. That happened when I was seven. When I was 14, I was introduced to Ephesians 5.25. And oh, a, uh, 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 a broader realization that actually, actually, on the cross, on the cross, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, that does not diminish in any way the other side, John 3.16. He loved me, but now I realize he didn't love me just for me. He loved me to make me part of that church that he loved. For, for what? For his satisfaction. So, so it, made, it made the whole matter of salvation not just about me, but about us. See, made it. It's broader, broader. That was the beginning. <clears throat> That's 25. Verse 27 says that he might present the church to himself. Glorious. And actually, this is an allusion to Genesis 2. That takes us to the very beginning of the Bible, where, where uh, God created man, but he created man in steps. First, he created the male man, and just one. And then, and then there was no helper as his counterpart. So God parades all the animals, all the animals. What a story. You know, we teach this to the little children, right? But that actually happened. And he's naming, naming, naming. And then it says, but for Adam, there was not a, a helper found. I'm paraphrasing. That shows that that parading of the animals was not just a kind of a zoological exercise. Let God just wanted names. Uh, Adam, do this job for me. No. He was looking for a counterpart. God was trying to impress him. You have to, you have to be joined to someone who matches you. That, 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 that's the biblical principle. That's the spiritual principle. That's the divine principle, right? You should marry, be joined to someone who matches you. That's why, young people, when you consider the matter of marriage or dating, you, you have to, it has to be a Christian. It says that in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 6. It implies that somebody that matches you, not just body and soul, but body and soul and spirit. So as the, the animals are going and he, you know, oh, giraffe, no, oh, gorilla, no, oh, a raccoon, oh, and, and, and no, 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 and naming all the things. And then what? No counterpart found. So he was put to sleep. He was put to sleep. And then his side was opened up and something was taken out. And that something is very interesting in the Hebrew. You know, I grew up reading the King James Version. In the, in, in, the, in the recovery version, it has it more accurately, according to the Hebrew. He built into a woman. He built into a woman. Why is that important? Because that, that takes you back to the New Testament, where, where the Lord says, I will build my church. I will build my church. So there's a, see, that story is not just a story. It's a picture of, of God's full intention, full intention. So, so when it says he will present the church to himself, glorious. Okay, then, he, then he, wakes at, he wakes Adam up. He wakes Adam up. And then one look at her. And he said, this, this, is, this is the one. I don't know if any brothers here give a testimony like that. They said, oh, this is the one. Okay, today's not the time for that testimony. <laughs> You will distract everybody. Don't, don't give that testimony. Everybody will go away talk, only talking about your story, not about my message. So don't do that. Even if it's true, God bless you for that. Okay. But, but Adam, he saw, he, he said, you know what it says? This time it is. All the other times it wasn't. 
This time it is. It's a bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. But at that time, in Genesis 2, God presented the bride to Adam. And, and there, very clearly, Adam is a picture of Christ. And Eve is a picture of us, the church. And there, God presented the wife to, to the husband. But in 527, it, it says something a little different. It says, he will present the church to himself. Glorious. Do, do you see this? Just this little verse here, this little verse takes you all the way back to Genesis and then all the way forward to Revelation 21 and 22 because that's the fulfillment, the last two pages of the Bible. So that's, in our, that's coming. That's, it, that's in, our, in our future. Oh, by the way, I just want to, uh, just a quick aside, just a quick aside. Brother Nee, Brother Watchman Nee, it has a wonderful uh, uh, exposition of this connection and, uh, of Genesis 2, Genesis 2 with um, um, uh, John 19, where out of his side, blood and water. And in the book, The Glorious Church, The Glorious Church. Brother Terry, I still remember the first time I read that. I read that and, and oh, God put Adam to sleep on the cross. God put Christ to sleep. And then when, you know, after he accomplished redemption, he did all those things. He said all those things, you know, seven words on, on, when he was on the cross. You know that, right? He said seven things on the cross. Yeah. I, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you what, exactly what it, what it was. Yeah. But, but actually, I shared this with you one time here. Anyway. Okay. First three hours, he said, I think, three things. The last three hours, from, 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 it was from 9 to 12, and then from 12 to 3. From 12 to 3. He said four things. The last thing he said, right? The last two things says, it is finished. That means redemption has been accomplished. And then he said, in Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he gave up his life. He wasn't killed. He gave his life. He gave his life. And then, oh. You know, they count, there was, this was the tradition because there, there was a crucifixion, which is a particular way of execution of criminals. And, and they, you know, you're bleeding there to death. You're bleeding. You're suffocating. And, and, and all the blood. And so to speed up the process, because they, they had to do it by sundown, they would break the legs of the, of the, of the, the criminal to speed up the process. And they came to him. He's already expired. Oh, sorry. But then they take a spear and, ooh, you know, something we, we appreciate because, oh, I'll flow blood and water. We have a nice song. But out came blood and water. You know, we have, the, praise the Lord. We have, so we're happy about that. But think about it. He's already dead. Why do you got to do ooh, this? I get mad sometimes when I see that. I say, like, oh, but amen. It, it, you know what I mean? You know, I got both emotions going on there. But, but why do they have to, you know, do that? But that's sovereign of the Lord. That's sovereign. Oh, by the way, it says, a prophecy, not a bone of his will be broken. You know, when you're crucified, everybody else gets their bones broken. But there was a prophecy about him. Not a bone of his would be broken. And so they came to, break. oh, okay. They don't break. That's a prophecy. They didn't know that they were fulfilling prophecy. Right, right. <laughs> but still, Oh, I still get upset. Why, why'd you do that to him? But I'm glad you did it to him. Yeah. So, so, they, so, but what happened? Something came out of his side, just like Adam. And then what, whatever came out of Adam, that bone was built into a woman and out of Christ. Of course, it was blood and water in the picture with Adam. Nothing, nothing about blood is mentioned because that's before the fall of man. So there's no talk about blood and redemption, forgiveness. But now it's after the fall, we need the blood. So when the blood and water, okay, so the blood is for redemption. And then the water 
represents the life of God and equals that bone. That bone that was not broken. It went through death, but wasn't broken. Do, do you get that? That's resurrection. The resurrection life. It's amazing. Even bones mean something in the Bible. So that was that life got into you and you and you and all of us. And now we are being built into a great woman, the church. Oh, I remember I read that. I read that. And I just like, I remember I was sitting down in my living room. I had to stand up and I felt like, I got to call somebody to tell them. This is amazing. I had never seen that in the Bible. Sometimes the revelation in the Bible, you just can't believe it. This was written thousands of years ago, and it means something to me today. That's amazing. The Bible is just, what, what a, just a wonderful book. You, you just need one experience like that. With the Bible, you just feel, shut up, everybody. Like people, you know, attack the Bible. People, you, you just like, you don't, you don't you just, sorry, you just don't know. You just don't know. Pray for them. Pray for them. But they attack. They, oh, how could you believe? This? How could you believe? How could you not believe? Okay. Anyway, that's my little aside. The Glorious Church, I just recommend that. If you haven't read it in a while, go back. I hope you just, oh, Lord, it's amazing. Okay. We're talking about Ephesians 5. 25 is the past. 27 is the future. 26 is today, is the present. And what's today? Okay, I, this, this verse, I'd like to read it again. I think many of us even know it by memory. If you know it by memory, just recite with me. That he might sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of the water in the word. One more time that he might sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of the water in the world. Nearly every word is significant. And so actually, my burden for the rest of the conference is just this verse, just this verse, that he might sanctify her. Sanctify, what is that? Sanctify her. So that's, that's we'll talk about that cleansing her. What is that? And what's sanctifying? What's cleansing? By the washing of the water. We're going to talk about the washing. That's something particular. Of the water in the word. Actually, even the word word is too significant. Sorry, that you understand what I mean? The word W-O-R-D. Is very significant. Because, because in the New Testament, this word, word, I don't want to throw you off here. Are you with me? Yeah. This word, word, because word is a word, right? This word, word, in the Greek is not always the same word. There's two different words used for the word Word. Sorry, I don't know how else to say it. Are you with me? Okay. So, so this word, word, in the Greek language, many of us know this, but there are some here probably don't, don't know this. Uh, there are two different words, at least, that are used that are translated in English and French and Spanish. And I think even Chinese, Korean, I don't know about Russian. I know Russian. I know about other languages. But two different words. Okay. One is the word logos. Logos. It's from where we get the word logical from also. Logos. Logos. And the other one is rhema. So in Greek, when Paul was writing this, when he wrote the word word, that's in English, this is the word that appears. This is the word. And that there, there's a big difference between them, but they're connected. Okay, we'll get there. 
Every word nearly means something. And, and, and saints, this verse, this verse is our today. Is our today. Actually, it's very possible. It's very possible. You already experienced this verse today. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And it's not just possible. It's most probable, almost guaranteed. You will experience this verse this afternoon. You have to. You have to. Why? Because he wants to present the church to himself glorious. And it all depends on our experience of this verse. Okay. Let's start from the beginning. That he might sanctify her. What is sanctify? To sanctify is to make something holy. To make something holy. But what does that mean? Because we have different thoughts about holy. I know when I was growing up in the brethren's denomination, I had certain thoughts about holy. Holy is, holy is a kind of, a, uh, I don't know, attitude, a kind of a, uh, uh, something that, that the older brothers and sisters would exude when they just maybe walk this way. And then they pray this way. Our Father. I said, oh, how holy. Now, nothing wrong with praying our Father. But that was just a concept. That's not the biblical definition of holy. Actually, what is holy? In a true sense, holy is just God. Because only God is holy. Only God is holy. But, but then the Bible says, you shall be holy. What is that? Oh, you have to know what holy is. Because if not, you will take a verse like this in a very, very wrong way. Because, because this sounds like a commandment. You shall be holy. So, okay, then I'm a Christian. I must act holy. Many people take this way. Maybe some of us here took it this way also, just like me. So, oh, I have to be holy. So maybe at work, something happens, and a certain category of words comes out of my mouth. (gasps) Oh, Jesus, that wasn't holy. So I'm on guard. I'm guard. I have to be holy. But let me tell you, just because you don't curse for one day does not make you holy. Not behaving a certain way is not holy. But if you are filled with God, saturated with God, and therefore you don't curse, that's holy. There's a big difference. Okay. To be holy, to be holy is to be separated. Actually, this word fundamentally means this, separate. To be separated. Or to be what? Different. To be set apart. Set apart from what? Set apart from everything that is not God. So listen. When the Bible says, you know, it says in in, in Peter, you shall be holy. Oh, what does that mean? That doesn't mean try your best. That means God is doing something in your life to make you him. One day, you will be him. Amen. So that's what these verses are saying. We read Ephesians 1. Verses 4 and 5. Let's, maybe we should read those again. Here it says, <clears throat> Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy. You know what that means? That means in eternity past, before you were, before you did anything, 
and particularly before you did anything bad or good, he chose you, he decided, I like you, I choose you, and you will be me. Not just like me, you will be me. Then it continues. And without blemish before him in love. Any blemishes in our lives? Any blemishes? You know, here in, in uh, 527, it says he'll present the church to himself. Glorious. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that she would be what? Holy and without blemish. Holy and without blemish. Sorry, in our natural life, in our natural life when we're born, we have blemishes. We have blemishes of the natural life. But be encouraged. He chose you to be holy and without blemish. But you might think, how is he going to do that? 526. You know what? Just because we're emphasizing it so much, I, it just seems like we should have the number up here. Yeah, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change this to, to this, okay? 25, 26, 27. There we go. Because, there we go. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Because, because this is the highlight. This is the highlight. So I say once again, <clears throat> any blemishes? Probably still a few, probably still a few. If you're not clear, we can ask your spouse. <laughs> if there are any of that, you may have missed. You may think, oh, praise the Lord, I'm doing pretty good today. And we could just ask your, your wife, and, and she'll be honest with us to let us know. Actually, mm, how you may and you may wonder, you may wonder, how, how will the Lord actually remove all the spots, all the wrinkles, all the blemishes? It's by the washing of the water in the word, in the Rhema word, in the Rhema word, not just the logos. You know, let me this is the time to share this. You know, logos means the constant word, right? the solid word. Don't think, please, please, don't misunderstand what we're saying. Don't interpret what we're sharing to say logos is bad and rhema is good. Please don't, please don't have that concept. That's not where we're coming from. Logos is the constant word, which implies the, word of, the written word of God. And rhema implies the living word, it, it, it actually means the instant word, the present word, the current word. But, but rhema, as to a Christian, to a Christian, rhema is based on logos. More logos, more rhema. So, so please don't, don't have a, oh, this kind of thought. Um, maybe I'll illustrate like this. <laughs> the the uh, the veterans the old timers you re may remember we used to have a song like this um, there's a life that's deeper than our mind yeah do we still have such a song we still sing it but uh, actually if you pay attention I'm pretty sure somebody changed the words w w watch it says something like this there's a life that's deeper do you know this song are you familiar yeah I didn't think so some of the you're not the veterans that's why. I was talking to the veterans. All the veterans are like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. With experience of life yet so divine. Anyway, the chorus. Oh, Lord, we're just for your flowing. Okay, that's, that's it. See, like we said, oh, Lord, we're just for your flowing. How we need a deeper knowing. Okay, that's revised. That's revised. That second line's revised. You know what the original line was? Yeah, it was, 
Oh, Lord, we're just for your flowing. We don't care a thing for knowing. Say something like that. Something like that. We don't care a thing for, we don't care about knowing. That's like, you know what that's doing? That's like, we just only flowing. We don't, we don't care for knowing. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Also, don't throw your Bible. Don't, don't do that. Because without the knowing, you won't have the flowing. More knowing, more flowing. Now, you need the proper knowing. Peter prayed for the saints at the end of his epistle that they would grow in grace and in the full knowledge of God. To grow in the knowledge of God well, imply something living. But, but I tell you, you can't have the knowing without the word of God, without the Bible. So we have to read. Oh, but I tell you, you read the word of God, you read the word, and <clears throat> it could be later that day. It's often not that day. <clears throat> later. Sometimes weeks, months, even years later. Something comes up in you. Where did that come from? Where, where, where did that come from? That came from, you read this book. You memorized the verse for the young people. Maybe you went to a true school four years ago, and you memorized that verse. It didn't mean anything to you, except for getting credit for the verse. Maybe you got 100% verses, and you get gifts for 100% verses. Yeah, what do you get here? Gift what? Gift cards, like to go buy something? Wow. Wow. We give out like, you know, books. you like, you know, a little pamphlet or something. That's good. I mean, that's good. But you get a gift card to like Timmy's or something? Yeah. yeah. I want to memorize verses here. Maybe that's all it meant to you. But, but then... But now you're at home. You're at home. And, and you're, you're leaving your room. You're leaving your room. And then all of a sudden, you remember what? This story you heard. That Jesus folded the, folded the grave clothes. Why would you think of that right now? Like all of a sudden, you remember. You know what I'm talking about? When Jesus resurrected, they came in and they found, I think it says napkin. Yeah, the napkin folded. And, you th and, and as you're leaving your room, you just remember, napkin folded. What, what does that mean? Or I might be speaking to you. Make your bed before you leave your room. You learned that four years ago. That never meant anything to you except being a memory verse. But that logos suddenly became rhema. That's what we mean. Rhema means the word of God spoken the second time and spoken to you. Someone says it this way, said it this way. It's the word of God with your name on it. Delivered to you. Delivered right to you at, at, at the moment. I remember... I was probably about 16 years old. <clears throat> and, and I had a feeling that the Lord was speaking to me. Uh, just this word, just as I was praying to the Lord for over a few days. And, uh, okay, now, now I'm recalling a little more accurately. I was 17. I was 17. And um, the Lord said to me, stop. Stop. But I didn't know what he was telling me to stop. Stop. And then I, I had a feeling, wait, what verse says stop? So I had this thought, what verse says stop? And I wasn't that familiar with, you know, yet with the Bible. So, so I got a, uh, a concordance. Actually, I didn't have one, but I borrowed one from one of my serving brothers. You know, in those days, we didn't have like, you know, look up, you know. Stop in the Bible. You type it, and you get every verse that says stop in the Bible. So I got a concordance. That's a book. 
<laughs> okay. With a cover. You, you know, the, you still have those kind of things, right? Which you open it like this and there's paper. Okay. So I went to the word stop and I was looking for every verse, every verse. And I knew those were not what the Lord was speaking to me. And so it took about two weeks. And then I, re I remembered this verse, be still. You know this verse? It's in Psalm 46. 46, right? 46. Be still. And it says there, be still and know that I am Jehovah. Or in the King James Version, that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And so I went and I got my Bible and I, and I looked up. I looked up and I read the whole Psalm. Oh. My goodness, I got so much speaking, so much speaking. It talks about God being our refuge. It talks about, it says, there's a river. There's a river, the streams whereof gladden the city of God. It says, God will help her in the dawn of the morning. God will help her. Though the mountains quake, though the earth underneath you is, it says, don't worry. God is with her. And so then, then, I, then I realized what the Lord was actually speaking to me. Because at that time, in our church life, when we were in high school, we were very involved. And, and, and we had such a wonderful church life. And, and I think I was on maybe six different service groups. Yeah. I was on, I was on children's meeting service. I was on um, cleaning the cleaning service. I was on uh, a gardening service. I was on a uh, moving service. We even had a moving service. Did, did other churches have moving service? Yeah. Do, do we have that today? I, I, I don't know. I mean, we have the service, but we don't call it an actual, I mean, like it was like a coordination. Like we'd pray, we'd come together to pray for the moving. I don't know why saints move that much in the 70s. <laughs> But, but it sure seems like they moved a way lot more than what saints move today. Because we had one or two moves a month with the saints. Oh, those were great times. Those were great times. Because you get built up with, with brothers of all ages. That was so good. You get up with junior high, high school, college, young working brothers, uh, uh, middle-aged brothers. And, 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 then, and then they'd always feed you, whoever you're moving. Whoever you're moving would always give you lunch. It was great. And we got to know the couples. That was great service. Great service. I'm not, uh, you know, lobbying for bring back moving service. I'm just telling you it was a great service. But anyway, this is my point. I realized I was very busy with the church life. But I was not paying enough attention to my own personal life with the Lord. That, and the Lord wanted me to just be still and spend more time with him. That's, what, that, that's eventually what the Lord was telling me. But it took me, it took me about three weeks to get that speaking from the first time that I had that feeling. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Because I misinterpreted what he was saying. Why? Because I didn't know the logos that well. I didn't know the logos. Oh, I tell you, from that time forward, Psalm 46 has been such a supply to me over and over and over again. It's like I'm still drawing the supply from what he spoke to me when I was 17. We have to know the word. When you know the word, then he can, as the spirit, speak. Now, as he's speaking, you know what he's doing? Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Sanctifying her. Cleansing her. He's cleansing. He's purifying. We may not realize the impurities that we have. We may, we may not realize all the things the Lord has to deal with within us. But his word shines over us, shines in us. Actually, I told you, nearly every word 
means something. Cleansing her, this is very interesting, by the washing, by the washing. And so this is an interesting word. By the washing. We think this is very common. Well, there's water in the word. So, of course, it's washing. So it's, it's just washing. But in, in the Greek language, you know, it's really sovereign that the New Testament was written mostly in Greek. Because that language is so rich. But in the Greek language, this word washing is a word that you may know. It's this word. Laver. Laver. You know, the Spanish-speaking saints will know. Lavar. Right? Lavar. Lavar is clean. Wash to wash. But, but the word laver is very special in the Bible. It means something in the Old Testament. You know, there's one piece of furniture in the tabernacle that it's called a laver. And what, what is that? What is that? <laughs> when you come into God's house, the first thing you see is an altar. On the altar, sacrifices are offered. And that's where you meet what? That's where you see the blood. But then... Of course, you're qualified to be in God's house. So you move forward. Before entering the holy place, there's another piece of furniture. Round, a bowl. That's the labor. And it has water. And that water, I believe we spent time on this last year, on the washing in John 13, when we were here last time. That water, does, that cleansing is not the cleansing of the blood. It's the washing of life. It's the washing of the spirit. You know, sometimes we may confess our sins. You confess your sin. <clears throat> because something was unrighteous, lawless, even immoral. So we confess. <clears throat> but the Lord will still bother us with something. Not in the realm of sin, but in the realm of impurity. Impurity. I don't, I don't want to discourage anyone <laughs> from sharing. I'll finish in, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Then it'll be your turn to share. That's what I was saying before. Oh, you may have the speaking of the Lord right now in one way, because I'm speaking, the Lord might be reminding you of some things. Then when I sit down and it's time for you to share, you may have the speaking of the Lord a different way. Get up. You may say, but Lord, I'm sitting in the back. And do you think the Lord will say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. <laughs> I don't think the Lord will say that. I think the Lord will say, I don't care, get up. I say, oh, Lord, I shared last night. Oh, do you think the Lord said, oh, that, oh, that's right, I forgot. I don't think so. I think the Lord will just move in you. He'll speak to you. Okay. <clears throat> that speaking has, of course, nothing to do with sin. Right. Okay. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Just be free to share. But I wonder whether any of us here, we shared something and we sat down and then the Lord inside said, that was yourself. I said, oh, Lord, forgive me. Because I actually, I actually fed off of the loudness of the amens. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like the amen meter went, do, 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 amen, amen, amen. And I like it. And I wasn't trying to do that, but it felt good. But I hope you probably never experienced anything like that. That's, that's really good. But that, you know what that shows? Impurity. You love the glory of men. And then someone comes up after the meeting. Hey, I enjoyed your sharing, brother. And you're like, oh. But inside, you're thinking, oh, it was pretty good today, wasn't it? 
you may even think, oh, if not the top testimony, it was in the top three, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. You don't say that. You don't dare say that. But, but inside your, <clears throat> amen. I'm glad I'm so humble also. So I supplied the meeting with humility. Amen. The Lord may, the Lord may just pride. Or just one word, self. Or the verse may come up, the glory of men. And you just feel, and you, right there, right there in your seat, you just feel ashamed. Oh, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Now, don't say, I'll never get up again. Don't, don't do that. Don't make that. Because to the next meeting, to test you, the Lord may say, get up again. Say, but Lord, I failed last time. So do it with me this time. Just do it with me this time. You'll be more guarded. You'll be more guarded. I hope you'll be just as released, though. Okay? Oh, do you see that we experience it? Even in the meeting, this process goes on. Do you know what's happening? He's getting his bride in small ways. In, in, in small ways. Okay. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. This verse, we use this verse a lot to prove that there are three parts of man. Right? <clears throat> and the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I want to use this verse to, to point this out. We, we've heard ministry, we've heard ministry about uh, God's full salvation. And actually, the very first um, series, level one of the Summer School of Truth, is on this topic. You've probably all gone through that. God's, huh? Oh, just now, just now. God's full salvation. Okay, so, oh, so I can quiz them. <laughs> on what are the five aspects of Judicial redemption and the eight, is it eight or six? How did you present it? Depends on what ministry you used. Anyway, no, I'm not going to quiz you either. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I, I, I was just, I was really just joking. It was a little comedic relief for a moment. Okay. Yeah, I'm coming back. Okay. So you've heard about judicial redemption, organic salvation. Judicial redemption, organic salvation. Um, and for the organic salvation, we, we have these, these phrases. We talk about, we talk about um, regeneration. You know that, right? Regeneration. Um, renewing. Uh, shepherding. Right? We have these. Uh, did I do them in the wrong order? Somebody like, oh, yeah, shepherding. Okay. Shepherding, which is the feeding. Renewing. And then what? Sanctification. And then transformation. And then what's next? building, uh, and then confirmation, and then glorification. Okay, that's when we have the eight, eight, eight. You can condense it to six. Let's not get into that. Okay. In this verse, oh, sorry, sorry. Regeneration is with which of the three parts of man? That you should know. Spirit. Okay. Glorification is which part? The body. And then we, we, we Categorize that all the others, the transformation, sanctification, renewing, and, and with biblical references, basis, we can show how all those relate to the soul. But, but look here. This verse says, and the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. You know what this verse is saying? That the whole process is sanctification. He's, he's sanctifying our spirit. He's sanctifying our soul. He's sanctifying our body. We shared this recently in the uh, elders training in Manila, in the Philippines. We brought this out in the, in, in the ministry that sanctification, sanctification, Listen to this phrase. Is the holding line 
the holding line of God's economy. Which means what? That every part of God's economy actually is sanctification. There's a line of sanctification in God's salvation. And there's a line of sanctification in our experience. Actually, we, may, we, 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 we talk about regeneration. Actually, that's the regenerating sanctification. That's when our spirit got sanctified. But you know what? Even before you got regenerated, before you received Christ, he was sanctifying you. Peter tells us that, that, that sanctification starts before that. That God was working to, to separate you, to, to even, I would use this phrase, to corner you into receiving him. Some of us have experienced this. Maybe we, the who grew up in the church life or in a Christian home. Maybe we don't see things that way. But actually, God putting you in that family was his sanctifying. To give you the best opportunity, the best chance to hear the gospel. And in one uh, book, one ministry book, I, I really like this example that our brother Lee that's Brother Witness Lee. He has this, this, this example of a fishing rod. I know brothers here like to fish, right? Yeah. I'm a city boy. Never been fishing one time. I've, I've seen it. Oh, and I have no interest. Yeah. But I've seen it, and I know brothers enjoy it. I don't know why, but they enjoy fishing. So with a line, okay, and it's got a hook. Got a hook. Okay, once that little fish takes a bite. Oh, it's on the holding line. And then, and then uh, I, I know that there are some, there's the rods that, that right away, you don't, sometimes you, you have to give some, right? Sometimes, sometimes. And they go, go, go. And, and, oh, and it looks like they're getting away, but uh, 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 here you come, here you come. And then you're getting reeled in. And then they go the other way. Oh, okay. Okay. We're going to play. We're going to play. And you go, oh, and then certain line, no, and then you, re, and you let go, let go, ah, 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 it's enough. Dude, that's God. He got you the first time. And then you realize what's happening. You said, you were so happy at the beginning. You said, no, 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 I'm not happy anymore. I'm, no, 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 it's not for me. And you go, and he lets you go, he lets you go up to a certain night. You, you go to that party, you go to that place, and then you think, what am I doing? That's like the end, that's the end, and then and all of a sudden, little, ticka, 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 yeah. and it's not like this. It's, God, God is just, and then you're just, you're just, you're just coming, and then something happens in your life, and you say, oh, God doesn't love me, and then you, and God, I'm sorry, well, the Bible does say he whistles. <laughs> you know that, right? The Bible says God whistles. Did you, know, did you know that? No? You can say no. Be honest. Yeah. Okay, show you later. It says he whistles. Yeah. You know, it says he laughs, right? A few times. It says God laughs. In the heavens, at the nations. The nations. The nations roar. And God is, well, I don't know. I, would, I don't want to say how God laughs. It would be totally supposition. But anyway, it says God laughs in the heavens. Yeah. That's why sometimes we laugh. We see the world situation. Don't get anxious. Just laugh. Because God is on the throne. God's on the throne. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Worry about this. Worry about that. Did I get God speaking today? That's what we should pay attention to. But yeah, anyway, the Bible says, I'll talk to you later. He, he whistles for us. Actually, sometimes, this relates to the message. The whistling is the rhema. You're like, oh, oh, Lord Jesus. I was going away. And he reels you in. That whole process is what? That's shepherding, renewing, sanctification, transformation, confirmation. The whole thing is shepherding. According to this verse, 
Sanctify you wholly. Sanctify you wholly. Okay, let's look at these last verses. Song, Song of Songs, chapter 8. These verses, I, I don't think we're that familiar with. So it would be good if you have your Bible to open to it so we could look along. <clears throat> I think if you read it, Song of Songs, it's the last two verses in the book of Song of Songs. <clears throat> Chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. If you read it, there's more impression and there's better chance it'll be rhema to you. Okay? <laughs> Let's read them again. 8, 13. Go. O you who dwell in the gardens, my companions, listen for your voice. Let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young heart. Remember this hymn? My beloved, come on spices mountain. That's, that's, that's the verse that is the basis for that stanza. So that's the song at, that at the end, this, uh, what is it, 1159 in our hymn book, is saying, come, Lord. Come, my beloved. And this is the cry. Song of Songs, Song of Songs uh, is the story of the Christian journey. Of a, of, of a lover of Christ who is drawn to him at the beginning, drawn at the beginning, and starts to follow him and love him. And incidentally, the Lord Jesus said, when I, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So that drawing of the Lord has to do with his loving us on the cross. That's 525. And then, and then 527, he will present the church to himself glorious. That, that's, that's this verse 14. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young heart upon the mountain of spi spices. So the Song of Songs is the Christian journey from the first time you're drawn by the Lord until his coming. But verse 13 is very particular. And, and it's not just the verse itself, but it's place in the Song of Songs. Just before the last verse, it means something. I'm not sure we paid that much attention to this before. Oh, you who dwell in the gardens, my companions, listen for your voice, your voice, which is not just your word, but your spoken word, your voice. Let me hear it. My companions, they're listening, but I want to hear it. I hope we all feel this way in the meeting. Oh, young people, I hope, I hope you would say, Lord, the, the older saints, I know they listen for your voice, but let me hear it. I want to hear it. I'm in this meeting. That one stands up. Oh, I enjoyed this. The other one, she stands up. Oh, I enjoyed that. I was impressed with this. And you may think, how come I wasn't impressed with anything? How come I feel like I heard this all before? Be honest. You never went in a meeting? You never went through a meeting like that? Like, oh, I mean, I was, hey, man, it was good. Got a little supply. But, you know, nothing earth-shattering. Well, I'm not talking about earth-shattering. I'm talking about God speaking. Did God speak to you, to me, today? Today, you know, there's such a, the, this is Psalm 95, and then in Hebrews 3 and 4, repeated many times. Today! While you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, I hope we have the heart. Lord, I want to hear your voice today. And there's two meetings. I want to hear them twice, at least. And then throughout the day, I, I, let me hear it. Let me hear it. Do you think if you would pray, Lord, I, let me hear your voice, the Lord will say, mm, 
no, not you. Too late because he already said, not you. That, I mean, that's his voice. Because he may say, well, I can't because of something, something, something. There might be a reason. Even that would be his voice. To shine on what's the problem? What's, what's the barrier? I like that it has this word, listen. My companions, listen for your voice. This reminds me of young Samuel. You know the story of Samuel? Young Samuel in, in God's house. And he hears, Samuel, Samuel. And, and, and he didn't know the Lord's voice. He didn't know the Lord's voice. So when he heard his name, he ran to Eli. Do a little experiment. Can you call me twice? Ricky, Ricky. Ricky, Ricky. Can you call me twice? Ricky, Ricky. A different voice. I could tell you, I know this voice. Sorry. Much more than I know this voice. If I hear this voice, I know who it is. If I hear this voice, I know it's not Terry. <laughs> you understand? Like, hmm, it's not Terry. But if I hear this voice, I've known this voice for, you know, decades. So I know this voice. It's familiar. Actually, Sister Ruth prays, I also know. Oh, I don't have to look like, oh, who is that? I just know the voice. So Samuel, Samuel, why did he run to Eli? Because he wasn't that experienced in knowing the voice. So it happened three times. Then Eli, well, at least, at least he, Eli finally, oh, it must be the Lord. Took him a little while, but at least he coached him. He perfected him. Then you say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I hope we would say, Lord, I'm listening. Lord, I'm listening for your voice. Lord, I don't want to miss your voice. Today, this afternoon, because the Lord may speak something. It, it may be this. It may be, don't say that. Or it could just be, it, it could be, it could be, don't think this. Don't think that way. You know, sometimes our thinking brings our whole inner being down. That ever happened to you? One thought, and then you dwell on it, and it just brings your, you walk into the next meeting, it's like, cloud over your head you look like you look like a, what is it pig pen from charlie brown He's, oh something going on over there and they come in just a cloud surrounding you it comes it could come from one thought and the lord may, the lord may the lord might speak to you it says don't think this way it's okay it's okay actually with the world situation so many things happening in recent years <laughs> the, the, just an, an inner feeling comes it's okay it's okay God is on the throne God is on the throne I just I, something comes up, the throne the throne and the Lord said don't think that way don't get caught up with that one little word so I hope we have a listening attitude let me hear it. This is our recovery version. Let me hear it. The King James Version says, cause me to hear it. I, I like both. Cause me to hear it. Lord, train me to hear it. Make haste, my beloved. Do, do you see that the Bible links that experience of listening to the Lord's voice with his coming? And I think that's the connection. That brings us back here. That's the washing of the water in the word. That is actually bride preparation, bride beautification. We may not realize everything in our daily life connects with God's economy. Connects. There are so many little experiences in our life. If we listen for the Lord's voice, 
Oh, the Lord will come. The Lord's coming will be hastened. I believe so. Amen. I think I'll stop here, give the rest of the time to you all. The brothers will direct us. How about we have a few prayers? We have a few prayers. How about saints, we practice this way. How about we just one or two sentences and let another follow and let another follow. And we, we pray a kind of corporate prayer. Okay. That way, that way the younger ones can jump in and newer ones and so on. Amen. Some prayer.